almost feel guilty because we haven't been recording lately the last, oh, I don't know, maybe a week or two because we've been basically cutting back and trying to coordinate our finances and bill saving and get things planned out so that way when we do the holidays we can get serious about, you know, some income and kind of do some other things. But unfortunately that meant that I had to take a step back on recording and get more things organized on the web, you know. I had to do things differently, you know, and coordinate my time a little better. And so that meant that I had to back off some of the recordings while we were getting some other things. And then the amazing thing was that as I backed off, I managed to get even more done and then found new things. <laughs> God's kind of funny that way. But my point is, is that I've been wanting to get back to Spurgeon daily, you know, and to sharing those quality, inspirational teachings that Charles, you know, Spurgeon gave to men of God to inspire them for their day. Because people like to tell me that they don't like religion, that they only want relationship. Well, while that sounds good, you know, I personally have looked at great men of God from the past and I am inspired by their personal relationships. They didn't deny the fact that they had a religious expression to their personal relationship. In fact, they said it enhanced what they were doing because they talked to God about it. And whether it be A.W. Tozer, Charles Spurgeon, or you go back all the way to Thomas A. Kempis with the Imitation of Christ, or even farther back to Athanasius or any of the other great saints of old, you find every man from young to, to old, from theologian, possibly like Paul, being a very knowledgeable Pharisee of Pharisees, to Peter, a fisherman, all of them had religious expressions. And their religious expression was the devotion to a personal relationship they had with God. So don't get caught up in sometimes some of the games that people play when it comes to religion or relationship. So what? I have both. Pretty simple answer. God always gives a very simple answer for children and for adults that need to become wise when the intelligent people have gotten become so foolish that they made themselves look apparently more ignorant of what God is doing than what they should be, which is to lead the way rather than keep trying to subdivide into smaller and smaller pieces. The Lord's portion is his people. Deuteronomy 32, 9. How are they his? By his own sovereign choice? He chose them and set his love upon them. This he did altogether apart from any goodness in them at the time or any goodness which he foresaw in them. He had mercy on whom he would have mercy and ordained a chosen company into eternal life. Thus, therefore, are they his by his unconstrained election. They are not only his by choice, but by purchase. He has bought them. He has paid the price. He has bought and paid for them to the utmost farthing. Hence, about his title there can be no dispute. He owns them. He is their Lord. Not with corruptible things that he purchased them, as with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's portion has been fully redeemed. There is no mortgage on his estate. He owns the title deed. No suits can be raised by opposing claimants. The price was paid in open court. And the church is the Lord's freehold forever. God owns it. God redeemed it. And God will save it. There is no mortgage that can be claimed. There is no suits that can be raised. There is none that has a price that needs to be paid, for God has done it all. See the blood mark upon all the chosen, invisible to human eye, but known only to Jesus. For the Lord, for the Lord knoweth them that are his. He forgets none of those whom he has redeemed from among ordinary men. He counts the sheep for whom he laid down his life, and he remembers well the church for which he gave himself for. 
there are also his by conquest. What a battle he had in us before we would be won, and yet he chose us and we chose him. How long he laid siege to our hearts, how often he set us terms to capitulation, but we barred our gates and fenced our walls against him. Do we not remember that glorious hour when he carried our hearts by storm and he preserved us? When he placed his cross against the wall and scaled our ramparts, planting on our strongholds the blood-red flag of his omnipotent mercy, and he gave us grace? Yes, we are indeed the conquered captives of his omnipotent love. Thus chosen, thus purchased, and subdued by the rights of our divine possessor, they are inalienable. We are owned by God. We rejoice that we can never be our own, ever again. We are not free men, we are slaves to him who loves us. And we desire day by day to do his will and to show forth his glory and to acknowledge his will be done and not our own. Oh, for the glory that God has revealed to us, that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died, that we should no longer be of our own accord, but rather we should be in one accord with the one God and the true and almighty Lord and Savior, Jesus. Father, thank you that you have given us such a great and precious benevolent means to know who you are, how you are, and the way you operate, your Son, Jesus. Thank you that we can look to him, that we can see him, that we can know your heart by what he does with us. In so much as he has come and lived with us, God, I thank you that you have placed him in us by your Spirit. Lead us, O oh God, by the amount of the joy that you have for us, by the precious promises that you've given us, and by the mercy that you've extended for us because of what your Son has done. In Jesus, amen.